All right, everybody. My name is James Lenhoff. I use he, him pronouns, and I am the Assistant Commissioner for the Multifamily Division here at Minnesota Housing. And welcome to our next, or the, the second, rather, presentation for the Stable Housing Organization Relief Program. This particular information session is specifically focused on the application information process that posted to our website last Friday and the online application tool that posted this last Tuesday. We thank everyone for joining us today. We know that schedules are busy and especially joining on a Friday morning, but given the quick turnaround on this application process, we wanted to get this information uh, session scheduled uh, to be a helpful tool before applications are due and give people enough time to prepare. So for today's presentation, I do wanna walk through uh, just quickly what we're going to review. Um, ever so briefly, we'll uh, review the program purpose and authorizing statutes. The eligible organizations, uh, that this is indeed a grant program, a quick update on timing. We'll spend most of our uh, time here today going through the CVENT online application tool, and then quickly on next steps and questions. For those of you that have been tracking uh, the information on our website, I'll note that yesterday afternoon, we were able to post the first edition of the frequently asked questions. Uh, not quite all of the questions are addressed in there. So if you're looking for a specific one that has not yet shown up in there, it's because we are still working on it, but many of the questions have been addressed. Uh, for today, we are gonna be focusing specifically on the application process. So if you are here today with questions regarding the future contracting, work plan, some of the other logistic steps. You can submit those questions to the email address shown in the presentation here at shorp.mhfa.state.mn.us. And we'll be addressing the contracting and other logistic questions in a separate webinar once we get closer to the selection process. We will also post this PowerPoint presentation as well as the recording of this presentation on our website. The PowerPoint will likely go up yet later today. The video presentation can sometimes take a couple days to get posted, but please come back to the short webpage for that information. And if you're not familiar with the webpage, you can go to the Minnesota Housing website, and we have a great search bar right up at the top where you can type in short or stable housing organization relief program, and it will take you to this particular page. So again, the program purpose, uh, coming out of the 2023 legislative session, this program was approved as a one-time grant program with up to 50 million in state appropriations with a purpose to support eligible rental housing owners that have experienced significant detrimental financial impacts due to recent economic and social conditions and all of that leading up to helping preserve the stability of housing for the households uh, here in Minnesota from the eligible property owners. And you will hear me talk a lot about eligibility today and statutory references. Uh, and I think as starting off there, it is important for this program, uh, depending on who was able to join today. Uh, but to be an eligible organization, uh, an applicant must meet all of the statutory requirements that I'll talk about today. Uh, and they must be one of two eligible organizational types. One of those organizational types is tax exempt nonprofit organizations. Uh, under section 501c3 of the Internal Revenue Code that has been doing business in Minnesota for at least 10 years, as demonstrated by registration or filing of organizational documents with the Secretary of State, and also federally recognized Indian tribes in Minnesota or the associated tribally designated housing entity are eligible organizations for this program. Unfortunately, public housing authorities, other government-owned housing, for-profit owners, uh, are not eligible for this Stable Housing Organization Relief Program. As I noted in the agenda, this is a grant program, and I bring that up because many of the organizations here today are very familiar with working with Minnesota Housing on various loan products, but a grant program is different in statutes and does have different requirements associated with them. Here I've made reference to the Minnesota Department of Administration Office of Grants Management, and we are subject to the policies under that program. Uh, are under that uh, administrative department. Uh, and it does require us to offer this as a competitive request for proposals, though the funding allocation is based on a statutory defined formula. And the funding selections that come out of these applications are subject to approval by the Minnesota Housing Board of Directors. Once we have those funding selections and with board approval, we will move into a process where we will have a grant contract agreement that will include a work plan and budget. Both of those templates will be provided by Minnesota Housing. We'll have that information available later in the process. And all the grant funds are dispersed on a reimbursement basis for eligible expenses. So this is not an upfront grant. 
that can be used to spend on future expense or they can be used to spend on future expenses, um, but the funds are on a reimbursement basis. They are not dispersed all up front. And the timeline, a uh, little bit small text here, but just want to do a quick review. Uh, August 3rd, 2023, so a, a little over a month ago, we held an information session, uh, first introducing the program. That PowerPoint presentation and video recording are available on the SHORF webpage if you did not have a chance to review them. On August 24th, the Minnesota Housing approved the Stable Housing Organization Relief Program Guide, also posted on the SHORF webpage. This last Friday on September 1st, we released the application information in a PDF format along with RFP instructions. And then this last Tuesday, we released uh, access to the CVENT online application tool, which again is where we'll spend most of our time today and where I'll be at here shortly. The application materials will be due by 4 o'clock p.m. on September 19th, 2023. Application materials and updated information, and you'll hear me say this a few times today, cannot be submitted after that date. That date and time are very important. We do anticipate taking recommendations to our board of directors on October 26th. So that is our regularly scheduled board meeting next month. And then we will begin the contracting and implementation phase so that we can get funds uh, dispersed once contracts are signed. And then statutorily, there are reports due to Minnesota housing in September of next year, and then also to the uh, chair and ranking minority members of the legislative committees having jurisdiction over housing that are due in January 2025. Uh, we are aiming to wrap up the program as much as feasible by then, um, but we also recognize that we may need to have some flexibility as we get farther in the program, but this is the timeline that we are currently aiming for. Now, the short webpage that I've made several references to launched uh, in earlier in August. Again, if you have not seen it, uh, please go to Minnesota Housing's website and in the search bar, you can type in short and it will take you to this page. I've added a little arrow here to point out the short guide and what may look like tiny print on your screen. Uh, please do read through that entire guide before submitting the application. Uh, down below, uh, you see the application materials. There is a link to the CVENT application tool, which is how all applications must be submitted for the Stable Housing Organization Relief Program. We're gonna walk through that page by page here in a moment. However, uh, we did also upload an application form in PDF format that is for references purposes only. The reason that we did that is because the online application tool takes you through a series of pages. And for some folks out there, it can be helpful to see the application all in one form. Uh, and so you can download that application form in PDF format. You may choose to print it. Um, what I think would be helpful for many is to review that application form in PDF format, prepare the information, and then submit in the CVENT application tool all in one fell swoop. And also the SHORP application instructions, which includes a lot of key information for the application process. Please read that cover to cover. It's not that long of a document, uh, easy to review and get through that information. And then just below that, but not shown on the PowerPoint screen here is where the frequently asked questions have been posted. Again, the first edition, there will be additional editions that come out with more frequently asked questions and possible updates. Uh, we will put those updates, uh, they will be in red text uh, when we have future updates on those. I don't have a date for the next edition, but do take a look at the one that has been posted. So now let's actually walk through the application form itself. It is noted uh, that each one has a section uh, letter associated with it. In fact, it is section A through section I, and that mimics that PDF uh, document for reference purposes. You can uh, track one directly with the other. And you see here I put in bold is please do read the short guide and the application instructions before submitting the information because there is really good and helpful information in there that answers a number of questions, maybe not quite all of them, but a number of questions. So please read those before submitting the application. Uh, very common, as we know, we fill out all different types of applications online these days, is that we have a red asterisk for all the required information, and almost everything in there is required, and it will note if you try to submit uh, information that is not uh, before you've actually completed the form. And also very common, we have these next and previous buttons down at the bottom. You can navigate back and forth while you're in the CVENT application tool. And what I should have noted here on the left-hand side of the screen is a screenshot of the first page of that CVENT online application form. This is what it will look like, where you will put in the name of the organization, the contact information, phone number, address, uh, email, and so on. 
Now, for the contact information, that can be a different person than the authorized signer at the end of the process. That is okay to do. Uh, so this should be the person that would be best positioned to help answer questions if we have questions here at Minnesota Housing. All right, as I have covered a few times here, there are two types of eligible organizations. Uh, the section B here asks you to select which eligible organization you are, whether you are federally recognized EMD and tribe here in Minnesota or tribally designated housing entity. If you are that, uh, you just click that button and go to next. There is no additional documentation requirements. If you are a tax exempt nonprofit, you select that section option there. And what will happen is it will open up a second screen where some additional information is needed. And what we need here to be in conformance with the statutes is the date the organization was established. As noted, the organization must have been doing business in Minnesota for at least 10 years. Uh, and we know that some organizations have changed names out there over time. And what would be very helpful is to have that chain of names if it changed from when it was first established to what the name may be today. Uh, please just be very clear with that information if the name has changed. And we do need you to upload a copy of that registration or filing information, the organizational documents that were provided to the Minnesota Secretary of State when the 501c3 was established. And with the information that you upload, please do have it show the organization name, even if it's the old name. That's why we want to know if it's changed over time. And please do make sure that the date the organization was established is clear. We need that particular documentation to verify eligibility. If you aren't sure if you have the correct information for that, you can submit a question to that email address I posted earlier, the shorp.mhfa at state.mn.us. Uh, and we can help uh, with questions related to organizational information. But again, the two key parts there, we need to be able to see in that filing information when the organization was established and the organization name. Moving right along here to section C, which I've broken out for the PowerPoint into three separate pages, uh, but in the online application, section C is all in one page. And the first part here that I have in the PowerPoint is giving us the address of the primary office. I, in the statutes, we do need to have the primary operations being here in Minnesota to be eligible for this program. I understand this address of primary office may be the same as the contact information on the first page, but please do me a favor and duplicate the information. If it happens to be the same, some organizations may have field offices, but a separate primary office here in Minnesota. So this is your primary headquarters office. The next line down, the total number of units owner controlled by the organization. Owner controlled has guidance within the short guide as noted here. And this should be all the number of units, uh, rental housing units, permanent rental housing units specifically, uh, that the organization owns or controls regardless of where it's at. So if you happen to be a nonprofit that has housing here in Minnesota, as well as other states, this is where you put in that full number. The next line down then asks for the total number of units owner controlled in Minnesota. So out of that subset, so in this example, if you have 2,500 units in your total portfolio and 2,000 are here in Minnesota, that is how you would answer this particular section. And then the percent of units in Minnesota. So in this example, just simply 2,000 divided by 2,500 being 80%. And we do need it to be at least 50% in Minnesota to demonstrate that your primary operations are located here in Minnesota. Unfortunately, the system, because we wanted to do something simple and get it uh, launched quickly, uh, does not have an automatic formula to do that percentage. So uh, get out your spreadsheets or your financial calculators, uh, do that quick percentage for us and put the percentage into the form. The next section, uh, also part of section C, eligibility requirements relates to financial impact and supportive services. And again, these are both statutory requirements. For the financial impact specifically, uh, the organization must be able to explain how they have had a detrimental financial impact due to recent economic and social conditions. Uh, there are some examples uh, listed there of what that may include. We are taking this in a narrative format, which means that no additional documentation is required for this section of the application. So we are not looking for organizations to upload audits or financial reports or cash flow uh, or any of that sort of information. What we want you to do is in the narrative, explain how. 
What I will note uh, is that the level of impact does not change the funding allocation formula that was set in statutes. So what we simply need to be able to see here is how the organization was impacted by economic and social conditions over the last few years. I'll explain that to the best of your ability. And then also the supportive services section. Uh, this is also a statutory requirement that the organization provide supportive services to a portion of their rental housing. So it doesn't mean it is all of the rental housing, but at least a portion of the rental housing. Uh, and these, those supportive services, there are some examples in the definition in Appendix B of the short guide. That list in Appendix B is not exhaustive. There certainly could be other types of supportive services. And those services may be provided by the applicant, the organization themselves, or it could be through a separate party or other type of relationship. Uh, the type of uh, relationship uh, with the supportive service provider and the organization, uh, I, we don't need that level of detail here. What we need is an explanation of the types of services that are offered to at least a portion of the rental house units in your portfolio. It does not need to be exhaustive of every type of service. Um, so this can be relatively high level, but please, do make sure that that answer is complete. And then finally for section C is the minimum unit count and types. Again, a statutory requirement for what qualifies an organization to be considered for funding in this program. There are three categories uh, and the organization only needs to meet one of those categories. The first one being is that the organization owns or controls at least 1,000 units of naturally occurring affordable housing, sometimes referred to as NOAA. There is a definition of NOAA that was provided in the statutes and is also copied in Appendix B of the SHORP guide. And I'm going to jump down to the bottom one there is that uh, another eligibility uh, offering is at least 250 units of permanent supportive housing. Permanent supportive housing also defined in the statutes and that definition is included in Appendix B of the SHORP guide. That middle category, which actually has more words than what we could fit right here, so please do take a look at the short guide for the full words of that middle option, but it is rental housing units, not including NOAA, of which 50% of the total number of units are rented to households whose annual incomes, according to the most recent income certification as of De December 31st, 2022, is at or below 30% of the area median income. Again, lots of words associated with that one, but a few things that I want to note because there were several questions in the frequently asked questions related to that particular criteria. So this particular marker is not based on a LURA or a regulatory agreement. It is based on the actual income of the household in the unit. So actual occupancy. We also recognize that not all units have a certification that is done every year. For example, uh, buildings that are 100% uh, low-income housing tax credits uh, may not have a uh, certification that's done every year. That is okay. It just has to be the most recent certification, which could have been before calendar year 2022. And I do need to note, compared to uh, some other Minnesota housing programs, units with rent assistance, for so example, Section 8, are not automatically deemed to qualify for that particular uh, option. So it could be that the household uh, is at 30% of area median income and receiving Section 8, but we also know that some households are above 30% of that area median income and also receiving Section 8. So it really depends on the criteria uh, within your own portfolio. Now, for the purposes of the application, this is a certification. So there is not a section to upload this information as part of the application but it is subject to verification in that final reporting and financial audit that is due uh, towards the end of the program. If your organization qualifies for more than one of the categories, choose the category that best fits your organization, and you may want to choose the one that could uh, be the simplest to verify later on in the reporting. Also, if you do qualify for more than one of these criteria, it does not change the funding allocation formula. So there isn't a reason to select more than one. And in fact, the system doesn't let you select more than one of these options. Again, there is some additional information within the short guide related to these. And I should note that that December 31st, 2022 date applies to all three categories. So even if it's you're selecting under 250 units of permanent supportive housing, that is the count as of December 31st, 2022. So if you've had a building come online after December 31st, 2022, it does not count for the purposes of eligibility for the program or in the future funding uh, allocation formula. 
So again, this is just for eligibility purposes. And to repeat, it does not require an uploading of information on, uh, to show verification, but it is subject to verification in that final reporting that is due at the end of the program. And then section D is total units for the grant amount calculation. So per the statutes and as noted in the short guide, what qualifies an organization for eligibility is not a limiting factor for the total units for the grant amount calculation. And you can again review the short guide for how the grant calculation works. It is formula based and it is ultimately based on the number of units that are eligible for this program and the number of organizations that submit. Now for this particular section, say for example, you qualified under 250 units of permanent supportive housing, but you have 900 units in your portfolio of varying unit types. In this section here, you would wanna put that full 900 number, do not limit yourself to what qualified you for the, uh, to be eligible for this program because this is for the funding allocation formula. Uh, again, the unit count should be as of December 31st, 2022. So if you had a, a building come online after that date, it is not eligible to be included in the funding allocation formula. Also, this number cannot be increased after the application is submitted. So if you find yourself a month or two from now realizing you missed a building, unfortunately, it cannot be added after the fact. This is also a section where you don't wanna overestimate though. If it is uh, found uh, that there were units included that you did not own or control as of, as of December 31st, 2022, and if funds were dispersed based on that inaccurate unit count, they are subject to recapture. So this is a section I really encourage applicants to be accurate with the number of rental units, permanent rental units that go into the grant amount calculation. Now, perhaps not likely, but if you're an organization that has a thousand units, but you only want to put in for 500, that is perfectly acceptable. You do not have to put in all of your portfolio. Just note that you cannot increase it later. Within the short guide, there is guidance, again, on what it means to own or control a particular building or unit. There are several questions in the frequently asked questions on how or which organizations should count units if they have, say, uh, partners, other general partners. Please review the frequently asked questions uh, for additional guidance on those situations. And if you're in a particularly atypical ownership or controlling situation, please submit the information to shorp.mhfa at state.mn.us. But please do that before the application due date. We can help before that due date, but we can, again, we cannot allow anything to be added after the due date. So this is a particularly important section right here to have a correct number. Now, again, like the eligibility, um, this is self-certification. So there is not a spot to upload documentation that Minnesota Housing will review to verify that number, but this number will be part of the verification process and the final reporting. So this is again, where you want to be accurate with that number. Uh, and if you hear me repeating myself on that part, it's because it is particularly important uh, in that section. All right, we're gonna to move to the next one. Section E, eligible uses. So early on, you heard me refer to this work plan uh, and budget that ultimately will be included with the grant contract agreement. Now today, it is not possible for anyone to put together an actual budget of how they will use the grant funds because the grant funds are based on the number of applicants and units that come into the process. So no one will know the actual amount of grant funding available to their organization until after selections. But what we do need to know for the application is which of the eligible uses you anticipate using as part of that work plan and agreement. You must select at least one of them. And the options of the statutory eligible uses are property maintenance, improvement, and security, providing services, including uh, services and programming to promote economic and social mobility, efforts to attract and retain employees that will assist in providing services and supports to tenants, and forgiveness of all or a portion of rent balances owed by former or current tenants, which has been a particular source of interest for the frequently asked questions. And then there is a general uh, ability for applicants to propose additional uses if they can make a case that they would have, that those particular uses would have a beneficial impact on the housing stability of tenants. So in this section, as I noted, you must select at least one. You can select all of them, even if you ultimately don't use them in the work plan. 
And many of you may choose to select all of them to leave those options open, and that is okay. And again, if you do propose additional uses, be very clear in the description and how you believe that will have a beneficial impact on the housing stability of the tenants. Uh, those particular proposals uh, will not or cannot receive a pre-approval before the application date. So this is your chance to make the argument for those uses. I would note though that it cannot be for expenses that were incurred before the grant contract is fully executed. And that is the case for all of the expense categories, except for one that I'll touch upon in a moment, is that it, the expenses can only be for after, expenses incurred after the grant contract is executed. So for example, if you have maintenance activities that occurred this month, they would not be eligible for reimbursement, but if they occurred after the agreement is signed, they are eligible. Um, in this particular case, you can't propose things that were that occurred before the grant contract agreement is fully executed. The only expense that is eligible to be reimbursed that occurred before the grant contract agreement is executed is uh, those of the forgiveness of a portion of rent balance as owed subject to certain conditions that are outlined in the short agreement. Um, and as I noted at the beginning here, no budget numbers are required at this time. This is intended to be a simple acknowledgement of which eligible uses you anticipate using that we will translate over into a template for a work plan and budget after we do selections. And then section F, existing vendor relationships. And this might be one of the more unique sections for many of you, and this does relate it to being a grant program. I put this under the category of please help me so I can help you. So in the RFP instructions, many of you may have noted that there are contracting and bidding requirements that are subject to grant programs that must occur. However, there is some flexibility to waive those contracting and bidding requirements for applicants that have existing vendor relationships and contracts in place at the time the application is submitted. So for example, many of you may have third-party property management or you may have third-party maintenance contracts perhaps third-party security services or supportive services that have contracts now. I recognize it would be inconvenient at best to have to do a new contracting and bidding process for those existing relationships. So what you want to do here and be as comprehensive as you can be is to list those existing vendor relationships. You wanna use the actual name of the entity for where you have that relationship. So if you do, again, contract for property management services, you wanna use their actual legal name to be listed here. Um, what you can't do uh, is just have something general, uh, you know, roofing organization in the future. It would have to be, we actually know who is providing those services now. Um, we cannot allow any additions to this list after the application is submitted. So that's where you wanna be comprehensive now with those existing relationships. Um, but we do not need copies of those agreements right now. We do not need uh, all the details. This is simply a list of those relationships so that it can be an easier process after grant contracts are signed for those existing relationships. If you aren't sure if one qualifies, you can email at the short.mhfa at state.mn.us. But again, uh, let's really put this in the category of help me help you on those existing vendor relationships. All right, we're moving right along here. Uh, the next section, section G, organizational financial documentation and affirmative action form. Again, these are requirements related to all Minnesota housing grant programs and many of our other programs for that matter. Uh, and this is where you have to upload a particular organizational financial documentation. Uh, and this is of the applicant, not individual properties or other third party providers. This is of the 501c3 itself uh, needs to upload or uh, needs to upload the documentation here. And you can also download the affirmative action certification form. If you aren't sure which uh, uh, financial information to upload, please do review that section of the program guide and it provides details on exactly what needs to be submitted, but it is a requirement and it does need to be included for all of the 501c3 nonprofit applicants. The next section, uh, perhaps the easiest one, uh, is the data privacy notice. So read it, 
and click next. If you have questions, let us know, but it is a requirement to acknowledge the data privacy notice, uh, which is part of the overall application. And then the final section uh, is the certification of accuracy and signature. A big part of this application process is that it is based on self-certification, which we are allowed to do under the statutes for this particular program. Please do read all sections of the certification. If you have questions on them, let us know, because it is important that all applicants understand what is required as part of the certification of accuracy. Uh, but you do need to certify to it to be eligible for the program. So that's where you check the box that I have put the red arrow next to for the purpose of this screen. Uh, you, this is where you will type in the authorized applicant name and their title. We do not have a separate signature page for the purposes of the application. It is typing it in. It is specifically for this program. I recognize other Minnesota programs may have other signature requirements. This does not change other programs. This is just for the Stable Housing Organization Relief Program. And eventually, when we do have uh, contract agreements, those will be done through DocuSign uh, electronically as well. So again, read this section. You have to click the certification authorized and you have to type in the name to be able to submit the application. And once you do click finish, you will see this page that it has been submitted. I'm gonna go back for a second. Now, while you're going through the process, if you're like, oh gosh darn, I think I made an error earlier. Uh, there is a previous button and you can navigate all the way back to the beginning of the application to review the information. But once it is submitted, uh, you can't go back yourself to make changes to the application. So you want to make sure you don't hit finish until you are comfortable with all the information that has been submitted. And that's where I think it would be helpful if you download the PDF version of the application form, collect all of the information that will be submitted, and then submit it here all in one fell swoop. But I also know that we are human, and I have made errors myself submitting applications, including to Minnesota Housing before I worked here. Uh, and if you find yourself that you think you made an error or know you made an error, and it's before the application due date, you can reach out to us and we do have the ability to reopen an application, um, but only before the due date. Once we get past the due date, applications cannot be reopened. As I noted earlier, the Cvent application tool is built on a pretty straightforward platform, but it is a relatively simple platform. So there is not an account to create or a login and password to create for this particular program. I also know that sometimes people will start submitting information and any number of things can take you away from an application form that then times out. If you do, if that happens to you, go back to the Minnesota Housing webpage, click on the Cvent application tool, and when you input the same email and contact information that you started off with, it should, and I emphasize should, bring you back to the application where you submitted information, but you should double check to make sure all the information is accurate. If it started off blank after you do that, I apologize. Uh, what we wanted to do was to have a simple application format and launch as quickly as possible. Something more sophisticated would have taken a fair amount more time. Uh, this was an existing system we were able to reutilize to get the application form out there. But again, if you have questions or if you run into technical difficulties, use that schwarp.mhfa at state.mn.us email address. All right, that gets us through walking through the application form and that is the full application form. You saw the sections that need to be uploaded. Uh, with that, uh, and if you do run into questions as you go along, please let us know. Uh, again, to reemphasize reviewing the program guide, the RFP instructions, and now the frequently asked questions before submitting the application materials. But once the application date does close on September 19th, agency staff will begin reviewing the applications for eligibility, eligibility and completeness. This is a spot where we have very limited ability to reach out for clarification. So this is where you wanna make sure what you submit is accurate. Uh, Minnesota Housing staff will then calculate the total number of rental units to be used in the allocation formula, and we'll calculate the amount of funding per eligible organization, and then make recommendations in October to the Minnesota Housing Board that includes the funding allocations anticipated for each organization. Now, as many of you know, uh, our Minnesota Housing Board meetings tend to be the last Thursday of the month. Uh, and we often post, I think always post, the board materials a week before the board meeting, but anything in that board packet 
is subject to final review and approval by the Minnesota Housing Board of Directors. So there is potential for change even after the, the board packet goes out. After the Board of Directors approves the funding selections, grantees will receive an approval letter from Minnesota Housing with the funding allocation amount and due diligence requirements. Again, we will have a webinar on that due diligence, what it means to have the work plan and budget requirements. I will say that that work plan and budget is going to be relatively high level, in part because I know it's gonna be challenging for everyone to predict out all of their future expenses, but we'll work with you on that. I, we will then execute the grant contract agreement. Uh, we will have grantee then start submitting reimbursement for eligible expenses, which will have a process and an electronic upload process and electronic payment process for all of those disbursements. And then of course, at the very, well, maybe not quite at the very end, uh, depending on where applicants are in terms of expenditures, but there is that financial audit and reporting that is a statutory requirement with information in the program guide. All right, as I've said a couple times here, frequently asked questions, that first round posted on the SHORP webpage yesterday. For applications, for application related questions specifically, I need those no later than September 11th at 4 p.m. You can still submit app questions not related to the application after that date. But what I wanna make sure is that questions that apply to all applicants that we're able to share that information in the next version of the FAQs before the application due date, and it does sometimes take a bit of time to pull answers together to make sure that they're consistent and accurate. So application-related questions are due to that email address no later than September 11th, 2023 at 4 p.m. Any non-application request questions, still go ahead and submit them. We'll address those as part of future FAQs. So that is the presentation. I did have a lot to say there. Uh, I recognize some of it may have been simple, some of it a bit more complex. I have no doubt that there are probably still some questions out there. For our next step here, uh, we will open up for questions, which I believe people can do in the chat. I think Patty, you're out there to help me facilitate. For today, the questions are focused on the application. If you have questions related to contracting, reimbursements, uh, particular eligible uses that will get addressed as uh, post-application process, please hold those or submit them to the shorp.mhfa at state.mn.us email address. And also, if we do have any attendees that are seeking out rental assistance uh, for their personal needs, uh, unfortunately, SHORP does not address uh, direct rental assistance, but we do have information on Minnesota's housing website for where uh, people can seek housing help uh, in other parts of Minnesota. So with that, I'll conclude my direct presentation and open up for questions in the remaining time that we have on the webinar today. And I'm trying to adjust my own screen here so I can see the questions. All right, so I see at least one question here. Should you count transitional housing units in the total unit count? And per the program guide, transitional housing does not uh, is not an eligible type of rental unit uh, for the Stable Housing Organization Relief Program. And let me see if there are other questions. There are, and I have to figure out how to make my screen bigger. Yeah, sorry, James. Um, yeah, if you can drag that, the questions bar over to the middle of your screen, then you can um, expand the size of it. While you're doing that, we actually have a participant who would like to speak to the, to speak to you. So I'm gonna unmute their line. Deborah, feel free to ask your question of James. I didn't see a question. You have to click on this. Oh, that was a back arrow. No, that's not very intuitive. I don't no, know it's an Deborah, your line is unmuted. Oh, sorry, I'm trying to type. Um, <laughs> this will be faster. Thank you. Yeah. Um, for the vendor list, um, you had noted that if we have a current contract or agreement in place, but if we have a whole raft of vendors that we contact for routine replacements like carpeting or painting or even plumbing or electrical needs, but there's not necessarily a contract in place or a service agreement in place for that vendor at the time of application, I'm assuming we can include those vendors or not. 
That is a great question. And let me get a confirmation on that and then share that information with everyone. I, I understand what you're asking, and I just I just want to confirm with our grants expert. I, I play a grants expert on webinars, but I want to make sure I get you the right answer. Okay, thank you. And Patty, I, the, the section that has questions is not willing to expand on my screen. Well, if you want, I can read them for you. Yeah, if we can start at the top there, that would be sure. That'd be very helpful. Yep, no problem. Uh, Deborah, did you have another question? Sorry, no. Okay. Okay, so the first one is um, our properties are LLCs. Do we need to list the unique LLCs in the vendor list? No. No, uh, properties uh, that are owned by limited partnerships or LLCs or something where the applicant is part of the ownership you do not need to list those. Those are not considered vendors for the purposes of the Stable Housing Organization Relief Program. We also recognize that not all the vendors will have their relationship with the applicant. There just needs to be a relationship in place, and that's where I'll get clarity on those uh, relationships that Deborah was referring to. Great. Um, we have a question about the affirmative action form um, about it being electronic or a wet signature. Can you just touch base on that again? I, I don't have the form open in front of me here, but for the form, you can use an electronic signature on that. So if you fill it out online and paste in a signature or use your version of DocuSign or Adobe signature, just as long as there is a signature there, that will meet the requirement. Mm -hmm. Uh, normally, the tribal chairperson signs off on the applicants for applications for grants. Is it okay to have the submitter sign the application at the end of the CFUN process? Uh, can Can you say that again, Patty? The yeah. audio just cut out. Really. <clears throat> sure. Normally, the tribal chairperson signs off on the applications for grants, but in this particular case, is it okay for the submitter to sign the application at the end of the CFUN process, like when you're filling out the CFUN form? Yeah, so what I'll say broadly here is that it should be a person that is authorized in their organization to be able to submit applications. So whether it is a tribal partner or a nonprofit partner, if they have something internally that makes them an authorized signature, that is acceptable. Uh, what we just want to make sure is that ultimately on the uh, grant contract agreement that will come later in the process, that we do make sure that it gets routed to the necessary signatory there. So in some cases, it could be a staff person that is the authorized signer. Uh, but they'll need to determine that within their organization. Thank you. Um, units that receive rental assistance from HUD or Minnesota Housing, are those considered qualifiers or, or does that exclude them from qualifying from the program? I, they are not disqualified from the program, but let me add a nuance there. So for the purposes of being eligible for short, uh, units with rental assistance do not automatically qualify under that second criteria where it's 50% of units occupied by households and 30% of area median income. So a unit with any type of rental assistance, it may or may not qualify for that particular qualifying category, but it could. Uh, but broadly, for the total unit count to be included in the funding allocation formula, you can include units that have rental assistance, whether it's Section 8 through Minnesota Housing or another source. So for the funding allocation formula, and this is in the FAQs, this is, this is a good question, units with uh, rental assistance do qualify for the funding allocation formula. All right, thank you. Um, if that doesn't answer the question for the person who um, sent in that question, feel free to throw another in, or you can raise your hand and we can um, have a dialogue. So the next question, um, how current does the financial audit for the tribe need to be? I, I need to look back. I'll have to look at the Office of Grants Management Policy on that. So, how current? I'm just writing it down. And I, I will get an answer your... to that. I just don't know off the top of my head. Yeah, I'll get you a copy of all these questions, James. Oh, great. Thank you, Patty. Yep. Uh, so, the next one. This one might be getting a little bit deep in the weeds, so you may have to contact, but I don't, I'll try and phrase the question so it's a little bit broader. Uh, they have six ownership entities. One of them is a nonprofit entity and five LLCs. 
who wholly own um, who are only wholly owned by the nonprofit. Should we submit one application or, or do we need to submit one for each ownership entity? If I'm understanding the question correctly, and I do want to take a look at the wording of the question here, where maybe you can submit this to the email address, mm -hmm. there should just be one application per organization. So taking a step back for a moment is that the nonprofit parent organization is often the general partner in other types of organizations or has some sort of legal relationship to those other properties, to the other properties. Um, so in that case, so for example, if you're a nonprofit and you are the general partner in 10 different properties, all those properties are just included in one single application because ultimately that applicant needs to have enough units to qualify for SHORP at all. So it sounds like this would be a situation where you should not submit multiple applications. You should submit just one application, and include all those units. Um, but if there are some specifics or something I'm missing there, please uh, email me the information to that email address shown on the screen, and we'll we'll help provide guidance uh, if it's a unique ownership situation. Okay. But for the most part, nonprofit applicants should be submitting one application for their entire portfolio. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, we have somebody that wants to speak. Um, Elizabeth, I have your line unmuted. You're just self-muted now, so you can hit your microphone and you can speak to James. Yes, hi. I am curious. So we have a board and lodge facility we operate, which I do believe would be eligible, but some of our rooms are double occupancy. So for other Minnesota housing funds that we have through loan funds, each bed in that double occupancy room is considered its own unit for that purposes, for, for verifying the unit, verifying eligibility. How would we count those beds versus rooms for this application? That is a great question that I'm going to write down and I'm gonna include in the next frequently asked questions. Great, I, thank you. Yep. We have another one that's kind of similar to that too. Are board and lodge properties eligible units? And then also, um, can you, answer the question about housing support units and how those are eligible. Okay. So those are maybe two, but kind of yeah. thinking about the whole I, I think, I think, yeah, I mean, if, if the boarding would count as transitional housing, if it's non-permanent housing, it would not be eligible for short. Again, maybe there's some a nuance there that it's hard to give a direct answer on as part of this webinar. Um, and then units with housing support, uh, again, if it's permanent supportive housing, uh, units with housing support would still count uh, as part of uh, being eligible for the Stable Housing Organization Relief Program and would count as part of the total unit count for the funding allocation formula. Great. Um, I have another question. I think it kind of goes back to the applicant applying for the LLCs or like a bigger group, um, if we are a nonprofit who provides all management for multiple nonprofit housing complexes, can we as a nonprofit apply for all or will each housing complex need to apply? Can you say that again, Patty? Yep. If we are a nonprofit who provides all management for multiple nonprofit housing complexes, can we as the nonprofit apply for all of them or will each housing complex need to apply? I think the key that. part here is that that owning and controlling components. So mm -hmm. th there are a number of nonprofits out there that do provide third party property management services to other organizations, whether those other organizations are nonprofit or those organizations are for profit. For property management uh, services, those buildings would not be eligible to be included in their applications. So if you're just providing the property management services for another organization, but you don't, if you're not involved in the ownership, you cannot include those units in your total count. A different organization would be able to be would need to be eligible and then be able to claim those units. Now, if you are involved in the ownership, you own or control those in some form, as further detailed in the short guide, then they may be eligible to be included in your count. But providing property management services alone and even through a contractual relationship. Uh, you don't own or control those uh, in that, that same respect. So they would have to be separate applications from a separate applicant. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned a couple of times that there will be a review or an audit 
we're reporting at the end. Can you outline the consequences of inaccuracy or self-certifying units or services or incomes? Uh, yes, yeah, so there is statutorily required reporting uh, and financial audit, both included in the statutory language and then expanded upon in the Stable Housing Organization Relief Program Guide. So everyone should look at that section for the required reporting because we cannot waive the required reporting. I, within that, it does outline the potential consequences, uh, which again, uh, should everyone should read that section to understand the consequences. And there are a couple of potential outcomes depending on the unique facts and circumstances of any given situation. But if an applicant claims more units than what they have, and if we disperse funds based on those units, so for example, you put down a thousand units, but really you add 800 units and that thousand units is included in the funding allocation formula and ultimately funds are dispersed, those funds would have to be returned to Minnesota Housing if they were dispersed on ineligible units. There is also the potential to be made ineligible uh, for other Minnesota housing programs. Um, so again, do look at that required reporting section of the short guide for the potential consequences for inaccuracy on that. Now, if you find we get into the process and you submitted an application, you're like, oh my goodness, I did put the wrong number by accident. Email us, let us know before we get to those board selections so that we can correct it. We can bring the number down. If we need to, we just can't increase it. Uh, the next question, for fair housing requirement, our organization is native preference. Would this disqualify your organization? It would not. Thank you. Um, in regards to nonprofit documentation, should we submit our IRS letter granting 501c3 status as well of our, as our section of state registration for the organization? Uh, I would say submit anything you need to to be very clear on when the organization was established and that it's been in place for longer than 10 years. So including both of those documents would be helpful um, if one document doesn't provide that full information. I, I, I'm going to suggest spoon feed us the information if you feel like it may not be clear. Uh, we have another question uh, similar to the, the one that we just answered. Um, so Barbara, if that's not clear, um, let me know. We actually have um, somebody who, oh, they just right, they put their hand down. They thought they wanted to ask a question and then decided against it. Um, let's see. Bad debt often incur, uh, includes charges for damages or late fees in addition to rent. Are all items reimbursable? I so there is some additional guidance that was just posted in the frequently asked questions yesterday. I suspect that that guidance doesn't answer quite all the questions related to bad debt. And that is something that we are exploring further. So today I can't say that all types of bad debt would be eligible. I, it would certainly have to be related to past due rent, which there may be an argument to make some of those expenses related to past due rent. So that's something that we're looking at a bit closer and we will have guidance on leading up to when the work plan agreements are signed uh, so that entities know which expenses can be submitted for reimbursement. Great. Um, can an organization with less than 250 units of permanent supportive housing, housing qualify under the second category regarding 50% at or below 30% AMI? They could, yeah. For that second category, there isn't a minimum unit count. Uh, it is based on the household's actual household income, not a regulatory requirement, but their actual household income. So if you have fewer than 250 units, like you could have 100 units uh, and still meet that section, uh, that second option is listed. So it is possible, depending on unique circumstances of your particular portfolio and the households occupying those units. Great. And a follow-up question to the um, AMI, are units with housing support only eligible under permanent support of housing or possibly eligible under the 4B rental units for those under 30% AMI? Can you say that question one more time, please, Pat? Sure. Are units with housing support only eligible for, um, only eligible under permanent support of housing 
or possibly eligible under 4B rental units for those under 30% AMI. I think I'm going to need to look at the, the writing of that okay. one, and I might sure. have a follow-up question. I mean, if, if it's, of course, there's a number of properties uh, where there's just a handful of units with housing support that may be under what Minnesota Housing has deemed high priority homeless. Some of you may be familiar with that term, some of you may not be, but if it's a high priority homeless unit and it has housing support or not a high priority homeless unit and has housing support and is a permanent rental housing unit and someone has a lease for that unit, it should qualify for this program. Um, I, I don't think the, the LERC status uh, is an influence. I don't see how the LERC status would be an influencing factor. Um, it's more about the unit itself and is it permanent rental housing. Great. So we're getting close on time. We could probably do one more question, but I think sure. we'll have to That's just great. save the rest and um, you can always, we can always post more or we'll get to the rest of that that are in the log here. Um, the last one, our property is undergoing substantial um, rehabilitation as of the end of the year, includable in the total number of units owned. Yes. Okay. Uh, and then, ooh, quickly, one more. Is there a character limit count for the narrative portions of the application? So when you're going in the narrative piece, is there like a, a character count where they're going to run out of text? That is a good question. I don't know. I will check with the person that manages the form. Uh, if there is, and if that causes a problem, we, we have a solution to that. Um, so let, let me check if there's a character count limit. Yeah, I can reach out. Um, for that one, James, I'll take care of that since it's more technical. Yeah, if there is, I think we could update the system to allow someone to upload a document. That's not my preferred method so that we can keep it all consistent. Um, but we'll, we'll figure we'll figure that out. I, just in closing here, since we are at 10 o'clock, again, I want to thank you for everyone's time. I know there's some simpler aspects to this and more complex aspects, and some of those complex aspects will get addressed as part of the ongoing discussions related to eligible uses. And ultimately, for those organizations uh, that are able to be selected for funding. Uh, to repeat myself, or probably the 20th side, sorry about that, uh, is to read the short guide, the RFP instructions, and the application materials before you submit don't hesitate to reach out and ask about questions. We will be focusing on those application related questions first, given how quickly the due date comes up here. And if you do run into any technical issues uh, with the online application system, let us know sooner rather than later um, so that we can address those and not push up against that application due date and time, which is critical so that we can stay on track to make the October board meeting because we know that there's eagerness to get this program selected and contracts out so we can start dispersing funds. So thank you everyone. I appreciate your time and patience as we work through this process. Uh, and again, we'll post this PowerPoint yet some point today and the video just as soon as we can, but that may not actually be able to be online until Monday or Tuesday of next week. So thank you everyone. Have a great day.